I'm going to talk about uh, cardiomyocyte uh, proliferation and the reactivation of developmental signaling. Before I go into that, I just wanted to give you an idea of where we are. Uh, this is our Temple uh, School of Medicine, and um, we are right across uh, the Temple Hospital, and uh, which is actually one of the busiest uh, hospitals right now with COVID-19. And um, uh, fortunately, I think the, uh, the infections and, and rate of, uh, of uh, patient admission is going down. Uh, so things uh, are looking to improve. Our Temple has just, just started a bunch of uh, clinical trials on, on COVID-19. And a couple of weeks back was uh, one treated one of the first patients with an experimental drug uh, for COVID-19. So, so a lot is happening right now at, at Temple Hospital and the medical school. Okay, so um, coming back uh, to what I'm going to talk about, I thought I'd, I'd start with something uh, provocative. Uh, this is uh, a model of uh, how uh, regeneration happens in uh, lower invertebrates, and, and you can see that uh, a loss of limb or a body part is, is met by complete uh, restoration of that part. And uh, the hope really is uh, that whether we can get the same regeneration potential uh, in, in the human heart, uh, but this is what we get. And uh, the human heart uh, in response to, to damage uh, looks like uh, this, where there's, there's a lot of uh, fibrosis and a scar and hypertrophy, and uh, there's no uh, basically regeneration or resolution of the scar. So if you look at um, the cardiac uh, regeneration uh, potential uh, in uh, the animal kingdom, there's a sharp decline from the lower invertebrates and uh, as you go uh, to more advanced animals. And um, in, in humans, we know that there's uh, not much regeneration. Uh, the zebrafish uh, or amphibian heart is completely able to uh, regenerate itself. You have a ventricular uh, ablation. Uh, the, uh, the heart is able to regenerate itself and uh, there's a functional myocardium at, at the end of that regeneration uh, period. But we know that in the humans, uh, if you have a myocardial injury, there's, uh, there's a fibrotic scar uh, formation, which uh, pretty much uh, stays there forever, leading to adverse uh, ventricular remodeling and ultimately heart failure. So the question really is, uh, you know, whether the uh, heart and the cardiomyocytes uh, have the potential to uh, turn over and whether this can be exploited down the line. And this was a, a, a landmark study published in 2015 where the goal was to look at cardiomyocyte turnover in uh, patients who uh, lived in close proximity to nuclear above ground nuclear testing and they use uh, carbon dating uh, methodology to look at uh, how cell, cellular turnover happens in the heart. And you look here, the cell numbers for, for blue is mesenchymal cells and green is endothelial cells. And, and you do see an uh, increase in the numbers for mesenchymal and endothelial cells. But cardiomyocytes, which is the red line here, pretty much stays constant uh, throughout your lifetime. And uh, so the idea is that the, the myocyte number is determined right after birth, and there's very much addition uh, of myocytes uh, during the lifetime. So same thing here, if you look at the cellular uh, turnover, uh, they, you know, the, uh, the turnover rates are uh, increased in the endothelial cells and mesenchymal cells. Uh, but what the authors calculated was that over the entire lifespan of a person, is about less than 1% of cardiomyocyte turnover that happens in the heart. If you look at the uh, mammalian heart, the, uh, this is slightly uh, different uh, scenario here, and uh, the P1 mouse heart generally is uh, regenerative and can resolve the, the injury in 21 days with full resolution of the scar and restoration of function. Uh, but this uh, regenerative uh, potential uh, is lost pretty early, and by P7, if you take the mouse pup and you induce uh, uh, damage, there's, uh, there's, uh, the injury will not be uh, resolved, and then you get a persistent scar with uh, myocardial dilation. 
So what we know from the literature published is that the final wave of DNA synthesis that leads to binucleation in the cardiomyocytes happens between P5 and P10, after which uh, the heart pretty much uh, loses its regenerative potential. So it's, it's important to look at, at this stage, uh, why cardiomyocytes uh, are so resistant to uh, cycling and, and, and regeneration. And this slide gives you an idea of how cardiomyocyte cell cycle uh, looks like uh, during different stages of, of development, where uh, you know, in the fetal heart, uh, the myocytes can actively cycle and they can uh, lead to increased uh, numbers uh, and in response to injury, which leads to regeneration. However, uh, there's a cell cycle uh, arrest in the myocytes soon after birth. Uh, but this is irreversible. It, this is reversible at this stage. Uh, and the myocytes can still enter the cell cycle and go through it once, uh, which would lead to ultimately polyploidy or binucleation of, of the cell. But in the adult heart, uh, the myocytes uh, are, are largely, uh, uh, you know, exit the cell cycle and will uh, respond to either a physiological stimulus or a uh, pathological stimulus by a polyploidy, a polynucleation, or uh, endomycosis and are really unable to enter uh, the cell cycle and go through it uh, generating new uh, myocytes. So now having said that, if, if cardiomyocytes are really, uh, you know, post-mitotic cells, uh, how do you uh, reactivate the cell cycle? There's a, a lot of different strategies uh, pretty much targeting every single stage of the cell cycle and, and uh, the, with the goal to uh, push uh, the adult cardiomyocytes into cell cycle. Uh, so we have uh, G1 uh, uh, stage uh, targeting uh, signaling molecules. We have uh, tried, uh, you know, S phase, uh, G2 phase and then phase uh, with cyclin B, CDK1 complex overexpression. Uh, so every single stage has uh, pretty much been, been targeted as a strategy to reactivate the cell cycle and uh, make the cardiomyocytes uh, uh, proliferate and generate uh, new cells. So I have uh, the, the, you know, the interesting thing uh, right now with all of those studies is that you have uh, a, a lack of, uh, you know, the full uh, potential of myocytes uh, reactivating their cell cycle and, and entering uh, into, uh, into mitosis in a way that they can generate new cells. Uh, but when you look at, um, and, and that's, uh, that's one of the potential uh, roadblocks in adult myocyte proliferation and how do you really target it. Um, but if you look at the heart at really early on, uh, there's a transient uh, regenerative potential uh, in the neonatal stages. And, um, uh, you know, we know that, that the young humans also have uh, uh, cardiomyocytes that, that can proliferate, and that leads to uh, heart growth uh, early on. So, so clearly, there's some kind of a, a regenerative potential in the neonatal cells uh, that leads to uh, a higher regeneration uh, response in, in the heart. So um, some of the properties of these uh, neonatal myocytes are, are very similar to uh, the lower invertebrates, and these are uh, regenerative myocytes. Uh, they're hyperplastic, uh, largely mononucleated, and the oxygenation state is, uh, is low. Uh, mitochondrial respiration is, is really low, and the oxidative stress as a consequence is, is low in, in these uh, is myocytes and, and they more closely resemble to something we see in lower invertebrates. Uh, the adult mouse uh, myocytes are completely the opposite. So this is a paper just published a, a month back, which uh, points out to a really interesting concept of, of what the neonatal myocytes uh, um, and how they really activate the regenerative responses. And what they conclude is that they, the neonatal myocytes are a heterogeneous population. Uh, so uh, using single cell sequencing, the authors really found that there's uh, five kind of different cardiomyocyte populations and each of them uh, can respond uh, differently to stress. And if you have uh, MI on, on the heart, uh, you see a cardiomyocyte uh, population four that has the highest fraction of G2M cells uh, in, in, in response to regeneration uh, in the heart. Uh, they looked at some of the, uh, the gene ontology terms in, in the population and they, they conclude that at P1, there's a 
decline in cell division, cell cycle, and some of the proliferation-based terms. Uh, but the cardiomyocyte 4 population has uh, a substantial um, enrichment of all those uh, cell cycle genes, which pointing to uh, some sort of uh, a transcriptional control of uh, regeneration in the neonatal myocytes. And then lastly, when they look at the MI in the, um, in the heart, they see that the cardiomyocyte 4 population is enriched in glycolysis, antioxidant signaling, uh, and, and uh, cell cycle markers, suggesting again that there's a, there's a molecular control that defines regeneration at the neonatal uh, cardiomyocyte level. So based upon that, there has been a bunch of uh, different uh, strategies uh, that have been tried to uh, identify some of the factors uh, that are active at the neonatal stages and then reactivate them in the adult heart uh, to drive proliferation. Uh, hypoxia is one of them. We know that the fetal heart is hypoxic. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, so the adult myocytes exposed to hypoxia can, can reactivate their cell cycle. Similarly, mice one and uh, some of the microRNAs have been in, involved in and reactivation of the cell cycle uh, recently has been shown that there's a, a thyroid hormone-based control of uh, cardiomyocyte uh, nucleation and ploidy and blocking that uh, can increase uh, cardiomyocyte cell cycle. This paper, again, just published uh, a month back, uh, and which shows that you change uh, substrate utilization in the cardiomyocytes, it can drive, um, uh, again, uh, the re-entry of the cell cycle in adult myocytes. So, the, so our approach has been uh, pretty much uh, using uh, embryonic stem cells as a model for identification of uh, pro-regenerative uh, factors that uh, you can deliver in, in the heart. And we know that the embryonic stem cells have uh, immense uh, regenerative potential. Uh, they're a source of, uh, uh, you know, they can generate cardiomyocytes. However, the uh, direct injection of ESC is just controversial, of course. So, uh, is, you know, so that begs the question whether there's a way to deliver the embryonic stem cell developmental uh, factors to the heart without the risk of adverse effects. So what we did was we isolated uh, exosomes uh, from embryonic stem cells and uh, characterized them and as a control. We used uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts and looked at the size of each of the exosomes and then some of the classical markers of exosome, confirming that the uh, exosomes uh, coming from the embryonic stem cells were indeed uh, uh, confirming to the definition of exosome. So the next was to uh, deliver these exosomes uh, in the heart in an MI model. And we have, uh, again, as a control, uh, saline and uh, mouse embryonic fibroblast uh, isolated exosomes as, a, as an exosomal control. Uh, the mice were injected, and then we uh, followed these mice for four weeks. And we find that there's a, a um, increased uh, cardiac ejection fraction or fractional shortening in the mice uh, that were treated with uh, embryonic uh, uh, exosome, uh, uh, embryonic stem cell exosome compared to the control. So when you look at the uh, myocardial environment, there's a, a significant uh, reduction in the, uh, in the infarct size and the apoptosis uh, is uh, significantly decreased uh, together with a, a increase in angiogenesis in the heart, which uh, got the embryonic stem cell derived uh, exosome. So importantly, uh, the exosomes were able to activate adult myocyte cell cycle, and, and we looked at it by uh, immunized the chemistry of the heart sections that uh, came from embryonic stem cell exosomes and, and the fibroblast exosomes, and we see that there's an increased number of, of histone, uh, phospholipid positive cells, indicating a G2M uh, transition in the cells, uh, and uh, together with activation of uh, G1S uh, phase in the cell, which was uh, measured by uh, BRDU signaling. So now the important part was to identify uh, and look at what is really in the embryonic stem cell exosomes. And, and we did this by a micro RNA uh, array analysis. And at the time we focused on uh, micro RNAs uh, solely with the rationale that since they activate a large number of genes downstream, it would, um, and carry most impact, it would make sense to look at uh, microRNAs. And what we found was 
that the embryonic uh, stem cell exosomes are uh, enriched in uh, the microRNA290 cluster. And um, this was highly expressed in the embryonic stem cell exosomes. And uh, when we looked at the effect of this uh, cluster on cardiac cells and whether this cluster is able to drive uh, cell cycle uh, progression, we found that uh, the uh, microRNA-294 within the cluster had the highest effect on, on driving G1S transition and G2M. Uh, whereas if you combine with uh, another uh, microRNA from the cluster, uh, the effect is not that significant, suggesting that microRNA-294 uh, may be uh, the most uh, significant microRNA within the cluster. So we looked at some of the downstream uh, signaling in, in, the, in the cells, and we see that uh, microRNA-294 mimic treatment uh, leads to uh, phosphoAKT, uh, higher expression of uh, AKT, and uh, some of the downstream targets like nucleus stemin and uh, LIN28 in the cells uh, after the mimic treatment. So to summarize this part, uh, basically what we showed is that uh, the delivery of embryonic or developmental factors uh, within the exosomes, uh, including microRNA-294, uh, led to a significant uh, augmentation of cardiac function and proliferation. Uh, however, we at the time did not look at uh, what this microRNA-294 is doing and what role it may have in cardiac regeneration. So before I go into that, um, I'll just briefly talk about what the 290 cluster and in particular 294 is. Uh, basically, embryonic stem cells have high expression of, of 290 cluster, and as they differentiate into somatic cells, the 290 cluster goes uh, down, followed by a uh, increase in expression of LEX7, which uh, is uh, kind of uh, a feedback mechanism onto the 290 cluster. Uh, the 290 cluster is uh, is activated or regulated by uh, uh, embryonic transcription factors and has direct targets such as pluripotency genes and uh, downstream LIN28 and CMIC activation, uh, which so happen to be targets for LED7. So uh, they kind of act uh, in um, as an antagonist. Uh, um, and uh, when microRNA 290 cluster goes up, that 7 is blocked. And when that 7 goes up, the 290 expression is, is blocked. Um, the 294 uh, is uh, what we call it as an embryonic uh, stem cell specific microRNAs, and, and it forms about 70% of the entire microRNA content in the embryonic stem cells. So it really is expressed uh, a lot and controls uh, some of the, the really downstream uh, signaling processes in, in the cells, uh, such as pluripotency, metabolism, proliferation, and differentiation of the cell. The, the 290 deficiency causes uh, embryonic lethality, so it's really critical for maintenance of uh, embryonic uh, functions. However, the role of the 290 cluster in cardiac regeneration is largely unknown. So the hypothesis was that microRNA 294 being part of the embryonic stem cell cycle microRNA, uh, whether this microRNA can be used as a a driver of uh, uh, cardiomyocyte cell cycle activity and cardiac repair active injury. So the first thing that we wanted to look at was whether 294 uh, is expressed in the heart at all. And for this, uh, what we did was uh, we isolated embryonic heart samples from, um, from different time points, uh, embryonic samples as well as postnatal heart and all the way to day 21. And we see that the microRNA 294 expression is highest at embryonic 9.5, uh, followed by a progressive decline. And uh, by day seven, there's a complete abrogation of uh, 294 expression. At the same time, let seven goes the opposite way. And uh, the early on in the embryonic heart, there's uh, not much uh, let seven expression, uh, whereas uh, postnatally, uh, let seven starts to uh, come up. We confirmed this with in situ uh, hybridization of uh, the embryo embryonic heart, and we see uh, that microRNA 294 uh, is expressed in the uh, embryonic heart uh, very early on. So the next was to just validate uh, whether indeed uh, microRNA 294 is uh, the most effective microRNA within the cluster. 
And for this purpose, we took uh, the neonatal myocytes and treated them with different members of the 290 cluster, uh, 294, uh, 295, and 294, and looked at some of the really uh, basic cell cycle genes in the in myocytes. And what we see is uh, that 294 uh, mimic treatment leads to the most significant increase in cell cycle activity in the myocytes. So next we uh, looked at uh, some of the cell cycle markers in the cells and we see uh, activation of the G1S uh, markers uh, such as Ki67 and EDU in the cells uh, after microRNA 294 mimic treatment uh, followed by uh, the phosphohistonase 3 which is G2M marker and uh, then a marker at, uh, for cytokinesis, uh, which is Aurora B in the neonatal myocytes uh, created by 294, all indicating that uh, the 294 drives uh, cell cycle activity in the myocytes. But the big thing was whether uh, the uh, microRNA 294 is able to induce uh, adult myocyte proliferation. And, and for this purpose, we used a feline uh, adult myocyte model and uh, if you look at some of the literature on this model, the, the myocytes are really stable long-term in the culture, uh, and it allows a reliable system to uh, really track uh, myocyte proliferation and cell cycle activity. Uh, so we took these myocytes and treated them with the 294 mimic, and then followed the, uh, the myocytes uh, for uh, 72 hours. And we see that um, there's an increase in phosphohistone expression in, in the adult myocytes. And uh, interestingly, uh, we haven't uh, looked at this more, but there's a, there's a shift in the, um, in the percentage of mononucleated and binucleated myocytes, adult myocytes after treatment with microRNA 294. So um, this is another thing that we wanted to look at uh, since uh, highly proliferating cells that require energy uh, to uh, proliferate and re-enter the cell cycle. So we looked at uh, what was happening at the bioenergetics uh, in the NRVMs, uh, which uh, treated with 294, and we see a upregulation of uh, glycolytic response in the cells. And at the same time, um, we saw an increase in oxygen consumption rates uh, in the cells, uh, which was uh, somewhat surprising because uh, you, you have uh, either glycolysis or a shift uh, from oxphos to glycolysis, but uh, it, kind of suggested that the cells are somewhere in the middle of, uh, of you know, upregulating their cell cycle and uh, not really in a glycolytic uh, phase or, or glycolytic metabolism at this point. So now the next uh, thing that we wanted to see was, uh, you know, mechanistically, uh, what is really happening with the 294 cluster and how is it driving pyromyosin cell cycle activity? And for this purpose, we did a, a, a gene array uh, for some of the known uh, cell cycle markers. And we see really, uh, you know, alteration of a lot of uh, uh, positive and negative regulators of, of uh, cell cycle. And among them, uh, we found uh, we won as one of the targets for uh, 294 uh, with a binding site in V1 promoter, which was confirmed with uh, luciferase activity, uh, showing that microRNA 294 can target uh, V1 activity. Uh, so V1 is a kinase and it is a, is a checkpoint, uh, G2 checkpoint kinase, and we wanted to see whether indeed V1 is being downregulated in the myocytes. And uh, we saw this uh, with uh, uh, immunoblot analysis and, and qPCR, showing that 294 is uh, indeed targeting V1 and leading to its downregulation. So as I said, the V1 is a G2M uh, point, a checkpoint kinase, which is uh, blocking uh, the cycling B1 CDK1 complex. Uh, so the argument was that if uh, 294 is uh, inhibiting V1, uh, that would really activate the cycling B1 CDK1 complex and lead to cell cycle re-entry. And this is what we see here in, in the myocytes uh, that after treatment with microRNA 294, uh, the significant upregulation of cycling B1 and cycling D1 in the cells, uh, along with some of the other uh, markers uh, of uh, cell cycle in the cells. Uh, but importantly, uh, the CDK1 activity was also increased uh, in the myocytes. And, and what we do know uh, from the literature is that V1 inactivate CDK1 by phosphorylating it at, at tyrosine 15. Uh, so if you have a V1 blockade, uh, the tire phosphorylation status of uh, CDK1 would go down. And, and this is what we see with 294 
uh, treatment that is decreased uh, phosphorylation of CDK1 and tyrosine 15, um, indicating that indeed uh, 294 is activating the B1 cyclin B1 uh, CDK1 complex. Okay, so um, the next thing um, we wanted to really test now was uh, whether this means anything in adult myocyte uh, regeneration and um, the regeneration or cell cycle activity in the heart. And for this purpose, uh, we uh, had a commercial, uh, we acquired a commercial construct which carried uh, basically a microRNA 294 under the control of a TRE promoter element. And the idea was to transiently turn on uh, the microRNA 294 in the myocytes only, and then shut it off uh, after in a controlled way. So we confirmed the uh, dose efficiency of the microRNA and uh, vector, and uh, the, followed by um, the, uh, the st strategy for treatment of, uh, of the mice. And you can see here that this is an AAV9 uh, carrying construct, uh, as I said, with the TRE element which allowed us to induce the microRNA for uh, two weeks uh, after MI and then shut it down here. And so the idea was to label pretty much all the cycling myocytes uh, early on in, um, and, and in, you know, like uh, induce uh, microRNA expression in the cycling myocytes and ramp up regeneration response uh, that you can get in the end. So we followed the animals for eight weeks, uh, followed by uh, the analysis uh, of the heart. What we see here is that the AAV9 uh, microRNA-294 treated animals had a, has a significantly lower um, increased survival rate compared to the control AAV. And when you looked at the cardiac function uh, in the mice, uh, there was a significant improvement in cardiac function with uh, AAV treated uh, 294 uh, mice compared to controls. There was increased uh, contractility in the, in the heart, and uh, this was measured by hemodynamic assessment and uh, also by an isobutanol uh, stimulus uh, showing that the mice uh, that were uh, getting 294 uh, treatment uh, were, uh, the hearts were contractile and uh, functioning better. So we wanted to see whether indeed uh, there's an effective upregulation of uh, 294 in the heart. And for this purpose, again, we did in situ hybridization on, on the heart sections. And you can see that uh, 294, uh, microRNA 294 expression goes uh, uh, up in the heart early on. And we looked at some of the uh, downstream uh, signaling uh, or the classical targets for 294. You see that the LET7 expression is really downregulated uh, at day two early on in, in the heart. Similarly, we see uh, LIN28 expression uh, increased uh, and uh, V1, which is a, a, a direct target for 294 downregulated in the heart uh, after 294 treatment. Some of the cyclins were really upregulated in the heart at this time point, uh, indicating that the myocytes uh, or the uh, myocytes are really activating uh, cell cycle in response to 294 treatment. So the infarct size in, in the 294 treated uh, animals were significantly lower, as well as uh, there was a significant decline in, in tunnel positive or apoptotic uh, myocytes and cells uh, in, in the hearts of these mice. So uh, what was surprising was there's no difference in, in myocyte size uh, in, in, the, in the heart. And this was interesting uh, because there was no change in heart weight to body weight ratio. Uh, but we did see some increased uh, um, um, small myocytes in the border zone area, suggesting that there's somehow a balance between uh, hypertrophy and, and new myocyte formation in the heart, which uh, uh, really does not change uh, the cross-sectional area and heart rate to body weight ratio. So next, uh, we looked at some of the, the cell cycle uh, markers in the myocytes. And for this, we uh, had EDU uh, mini pumps in, in, in the mice, and they were implanted early in the first week uh, of, uh, of the surgery with the idea that all the cycling myocytes would be labeled. And then we detected EDU positive myocytes uh, at eight weeks uh, af after MI. And what we see is there's a huge upregulation of EDU positive cells uh, in the heart. Uh, and a significant upregulation of uh, EDU positive actin positive uh, cells was suggesting myocytes uh, that were uh, activating their cell cycle at eight weeks. We confirmed this with another way and we took uh, uh, the whole hearts uh, from the mice and digested them. 
and look for uh, EDU labeled uh, myocytes in the uh, isolated adult cardiac myocytes. And you see that uh, there was an increased uh, number of EDU positive adult myocytes in the 294 heart uh, with a change in uh, the nucleation status of the cells uh, coming from uh, the micron in 294 treatment. And finally, we saw um, a upregulation of, uh, of some of the additional cell cycle markers in, in cardiac myocytes. And we see uh, that KI67 positive uh, myocytes uh, increased uh, with a significant upregulation of phosphohistone uh, positive uh, cells as well. And uh, there was increased uh, number of cytokinetic myocytes, uh, which uh, uh, you know, indicated by a little B uh, signaling in the hearts that were treated with uh, microRNA 294. So to summarize, uh, the embryonic uh, cell cycle microRNA 294 is expressed in the heart uh, during development. And uh, 294 treatment really is able to uh, drive uh, cell cycle activity in uh, both the neonatal and the adult cardiac myocytes. The effect of 294 is largely by uh, activation of uh, or in inhibition of V1 uh, kinase, which leads to the activation of cyclin V1, uh, CDK1 signaling, and re-entry of the cells uh, in, in the cell cycle. And then delivery of microRNA 294 transiently in the heart is uh, able to improve uh, uh, cardiac function and, and structure long-term after, after injury. So uh, to conclude, uh, basically, if you take embryonic uh, exosomes uh, enriched with developmental factors, uh, is, is, uh, that they can effectively enhance cardiomyocyte replenishment uh, after MI. And in a similar way, uh, 294 through blockade of V1, activation of cyclin V1, CDK1, can again uh, lead to increase in uh, cardiomyocyte replenishment after MI. So I'd like to thank everyone who did um, uh, this work, in particular Austin, uh, who's actually moved on to greener pastures now and, and uh, we're in the lab, uh, but he did a lot of work and along with Justin and uh, some of the other people uh, at, at Temple who helped uh, with the experiments and, and my collaborators and uh, my funding sources. Thank you. Well, that, that was amazing. Um, thank you, Marcin. So, I mean, you can stop sharing the slides probably so that there we go, perfect. Um, so I think you know what to do. Uh, there's a QA and a box and feel free to open it and uh, start going through them at your leisure. <laughs> okay. Um, so I see there's some questions in the chat as well. So I'll probably start with Q&A uh, first and then go with the chat. Yes, uh, I think I think I've asked most people from the chat to pose the questions in the oh, Q and A box. So um, I think okay. they'll be there. The first question is from uh, Wiba, uh, and she is asking about the five different androgynous population of cardiac myocytes. How are they collected? Are they stage dependent or stress dependent? Do they have structural differences also? Um, so um, that's not my paper, but um, you know, so it's a uh, I think what, oh, what they, they did a, a heart digest and isolated the cells at uh, P1 to uh, P7. And then uh, in response to uh, MI as well, uh, they uh, looked at um, you know, the response of the cells to uh, how they'll respond uh, to you know, the stress and the activate cell cycle activity or not. Do they have structural differences? I'm not sure if they looked at it. Um, they just looked at gene ontology terms related to cell cycle. Okay, so the next uh, question is, uh, uh, are these human embryonic derived cardiomyocytes being used in exosome delivery? No, these are not uh, uh, embryonic derived cardiomyocytes. These are in mouse embryonic uh, stem cells. Uh, they're not being differentiated at this moment. Uh, we're just using an uh, embryonic stem cell uh, the right undifferentiated cells derive exosomes and use them for uh, delivery into heart. Okay, so the next question is on substrate utilization drives re into the, into the embryonic cell cycle, correct? If so, what substrates, glucose or lactate? I think they looked at uh, pyruvate uh, in particular. 
And uh, the, uh, in the argument was that if you change uh, uh, pyruvate um, uh, through the glucose metabolism, uh, you can alter uh, the cell cycle activity in, in the cells. Yeah, so this is from Heinrich, so a, a bit of a god in metabolism, so. <laughs> I tried to. Well, Heinrich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Caitlin is, is asking, have you tried any of this with human iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes? It would be interesting to see if you could increase the uh, proliferation of these while in 2D uh, cultures. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we haven't looked at iPSC-derived um, cardiomyocytes. We are just starting that work. Um, with the idea, again, uh, to look at, uh, you know, what happens with uh, human iPSC cells. I think there's a paper published uh, that talks about human iPSC uh, exosomes uh, and cardiac regeneration. Uh, but we're using the iPSC model for a different, um, uh, you know, different study, but, but absolutely battered, uh, uh, you know, system. Moxin, just, uh, just a quick interjection there. I mean, it's not really my field, but I wonder if anybody's actually tried uh, deriving cardiac myocytes uh, from iPSC cells um, using hypoxic conditions as well? Um, on the top of my head, I don't remember if that's, anyone has done that experiment using hypoxia. Okay. Uh, but we um, do know that, uh, you know, the myocytes can be pushed into, uh, you know, cell cycle re-entry with, with hypoxia. And I'm not sure if, I, you know, iPSC cells have been derived. Uh, uh, it would be beneficial at all. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... Okay, so uh, Weba has another question. Where did you perform the 294 knockout studies to observe the uh, effects on and affected targets. So I'm assuming she's talking about in vivo or in vitro, I'm not sure, but we, um, you know, we, we did um, look at uh, some of the, uh, yeah, or whether this is the exosome related work, but I can tell you this, we did look at uh, the exosome being knocked out for 294. And, um, you know, if you knock out 294 in the uh, embryonic stem cell, they pretty much uh, lose their ability or pluripotency status and uh, really cannot survive. And the exosomes as a consequence are not really effective. Uh, so in that respect, we looked into uh, the knockout effect uh, of uh, 294. And uh, as, as far as the off-target effects or different targets, I think that we all know microRNAs have a bunch of different uh, uh, you know, target genes and it's really hard to say uh, whether, you know, there's not going to be an off-target effect. But in our system, we were just looking at, um, you know, uh, V1, we did an, uh, an unbiased array as well, and we do see a lot of uh, alteration of cell cycle regulators, positive and negative. So it could be that there are some other, you know, targets, uh, 1494, that, you know, still out there. Okay, so what are the gene targets for uh, 294 in the heart? So, so kind of the same question. So we, um, we were, again, we were looking primarily at V1 uh, as, uh, as a, in a model system, since it had a, a site uh, for 294 and 294 was repressing V1. And so we kind of really focused on, on that particular mechanism. Okay, so Camille uh, is asking, looking at the methods for the two, uh, 2015 paper, I see that embryonic ESCs were cultured and standard conditions, so exosome microRNA content is non-specific. How does this affect the non-myocytes in the myocardium and what systemic effects uh, might arise? Yeah, good question. So um, the, uh, you know, see the argument is that uh, the exosomes will be delivering uh, contents pretty much everywhere, right? So they can go to uh, fibroblast and the thedal cells uh, as well as uh, cardiac myocytes. Uh, uh, so uh, what we uh, think is happening is that the, uh, the pro-reparative response or the embryonic stem cells, which exosomes uh, are loaded with pro-reparative uh, factors that kind of really uh, you know, transforms uh, uh, the cardiac cells into a pro-reparative phenotype and blocking the uh, pro-fibrotic or uh, you know, the inflammatory processes uh, in, in the heart. So there's no specificity for the exosomes and it's really hard to, um, you know, I haven't seen the paper yet that, that talks about specific delivery of exosome, 
so that is one of the limitation, but I think uh, the uh, pro reparative factors and the uh, transformation of the cardiac tissue in that state is, is the key here. Okay, so uh, the other question uh, next is, uh, what relative abundance of microRNAs that are transported by exosomes compared to microRNAs that are not transported by exosomes, for example, binding to cholesterol uh, molecules for use microvesicle? Are exosomes the main mechanism for microRNA transport? Um, uh, no, I mean, it's, uh, you know, so the exosomes uh, uh, have uh, so many different things in there right now. So, you know, they have uh, uh, a lot of different RNAs, uh, proteins, uh, long non-coding RNAs, uh, you know, so uh, what, and, and microRNA transport is not really restricted to exosomes. Uh, we know that some microRNAs have a higher affinity to be enriched within the exosomes. Uh, but uh, it's not the only way uh, for microRNA transport to happen. Okay, so um, Sina is, is asking uh, two questions. Uh, one is, have you considered inhibiting that 7 to increase the regenerative ability of uh, the myocytes? Um, no, we have not done that um, yet. We um, are looking at another target uh, for LET7 inhibition but we are not really doing uh, that seven uh, at the moment. Uh, second question is, it seems that higher doses of microRNA 294 leads to less robust responses and regenerative markers. What do you think is the mechanism? Yeah, I think there's a, a threshold uh, for uh, the microRNA mimics to work. And of course, if you, too much of the good thing is not really nice. <laughs> so uh, I think that the threshold is, uh, is once you cross that, uh, you don't see um, that response. And, and what we saw was uh, somewhere between 25 to 50 nanomoles of, of, of the microRNA mimic in our cell culture system. But what would be the concentration of these microRNAs, you know, physiologically or pathophysiologically? Presumably a lot less than that anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. so these That's might be off target effects completely, right? So Absolutely. And, and, and with what we show in the heart is uh, that microRNA 294 and some of these embryonic and developmental factors, they're not expressed in the adult heart. So uh, in the adult heart, the physiological consequences are absolutely zero, right? So you, you have uh, no expression of the development factors. And we are uh, reactivating, and that's the idea, you're reactivating the, these developmental factors in a controlled way, because again, you don't want uncontrolled replication uh, in the heart, and that's why we, the key strategy was the transient activation of uh, the microRNA in the heart. So we want to control it and then, you know, uh, look at what happens. Yep. So uh, the next question is an anonymous attendee. Is there an advantage to using ES-derived uh, cells versus uh, iPSC-derived uh, cells? Um, um, I'm not sure if there's an advantage or a disadvantage. I would say um, iPSCs, uh, if you think about a human system, may be more translational uh, compared to uh, the embryonic cells. And if you really want to move it to uh, human testing, it may be uh, better to have a more, more uh, human system rather than using human ESCs. Um, so that may be one um, difference between the two exosomes. Uh, but I'm not sure if somebody did a head-to-head -head comparison between the ESC and the IPSC uh, derived exosome. Okay, so Angela is asking, is the beneficial effect of 294 represent an alternative independent approach as compared to the reported regenerative cardiac response of hypodeficient mice after MI? Does, does, uh, does the adult heart contain more than one pathway to initiate a regenerative response um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the first part is uh, 294 and the HIPPO pathway. So uh, there's a, uh, it could be that we did not look at, so one of the clusters that shares similarity with 294 is the two, three, uh, 302 cluster, which uh, was uh, published, I think, in 2015, uh, which shows that it targets the HIPPO pathway. Uh, so if, the, if you're referring to that, um, we um, did not really look at the HIPPO pathway and, uh, you know, we um, did not look at what the downstream signaling uh, with 294 was that. Our approach was more uh, looking into uh, the cell cycle reentry and some of the targets that we looked at. 
and um, and uh, basically the uh, you know the reentry of the cells uh, in in the cell cycle. And of course, uh, there are a lot of different pathways. Um, you know, papers keep coming every day, so you know, so uh, there is uh, so many different uh, factors being uh, reported right now, and how the you know the embryonic heart or the neonatal heart is different than the adult heart. And you know, you can you can uh, there's so many different therapies right now to reactivate adult myocyte cell cycle. Okay, so the next question is from Laura, and I think uh, she's asking, I think you mainly share transcriptional data. I was wondering if you ever looked into kinase activity. For example, those kinases regulated in cytokinases, uh, that is mitotic ring formation. Uh, just because you showed increased number of cardiomyocytes and a shift in binucleation model as well as I think, uh, oh, okay. Oh. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we just looked at CDK1 uh, kinase activity, and uh, we did not look at some of the other kinases uh, uh, that were involved uh, at the level of the kinase activity. We did look at a root of B kinase, but we just looked at uh, with uh, immunohistochemistry. chemistry. And, um, uh, but yeah, it's an interesting point. It could be, uh, you know, as I said, we have not really looked into more of what is changing and how mono and the binucleation uh, status of the cells is changing, and that's something that we are looking at it now. Um, so Liliana is asking, were there any uh, arrhythmia episodes in the animals that received the 294? No, not that we, uh, we know of. We, uh, we looked at the animals and, and uh, we did not see any arrhythmias. And, and keep in mind, the, um, the approach was uh, just a two-week um, uh, induction of the microRNAs and and then um, you know uh, turning it off. Uh, so it's not like a complete long term uh, 294 uh, expression in the heart. Um, thank you, Tom, for Tomer and 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 me and collaborating right now on some of this this stuff. So um, are you considering trying AV 294 in large animals? Uh, yeah, that's uh, something that we uh, we are really uh, looking into, and, and you know that's probably the lead up uh, for. Um, with some of the mouse work uh, that we uh, have going on. And it would be interesting to uh, see how uh, large animals, uh, you know, uh, myocytes uh, react to 294. So another anonymous attendee is uh, the question in adult heart, have you looked if the markers of cell proliferation and apoptosis are co-localized with cell-specific markers of cardiomyocytes in enteal cells, macrophages, and others? Uh, yeah, good question. So. Uh, we, uh, we primarily looked at uh, actin positive cells, uh, so indicating cardiomyocytes. So uh, we have not looked at co localization with an endothelial marker or a macrophage marker. And uh, the other reason was that the microRNA 294 AAV9 strategy carried a cardiomyocyte specific promoter. So this is an alpha MHC driven system. Uh, so the 294 AAV9 in theory is only going to uh, the cardiomyocyte. So it, the only activation is happening in the cardiomyocyte. Uh, but there could be some kind of uh, crosstalk between the cells, and it may be, um, uh, you know, may lead to some endothelial uh, cell or an additional uh, cell population proliferating. Uh, we haven't looked into that yet. Um, okay, so Venkatesh is asking, have you looked at the microRNA 294 levels in cardiac fibroblasts? No, we have not uh, at, the, at this moment. As at, you know, the previous uh, question uh, is answering the same thing. We have not looked at other cell types at this point. Okay, so uh, Eleni is, uh, is asking, the last slide, the phosphohistone 3 y-axis, the barrier is only 0.3 in microRNA 294 AAV. Is that considered a therapeutically met goal or yet? Further research is needed to reach another percentage of phosphohistone myocytes. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, look, I mean, this is an interesting point, but um, keep in mind that myocyte turnover in the heart is less than 1%. So uh, if you're able to induce 0.3% histone positive cells in the heart, and those cells undergo, um, you know, I haven't done the maths yet, but you know, so if you have uh, an induction at that level, I would say over the period of time, it may lead to a significant uh, generation of cells. But, but again, a lot of work is needed uh, at the moment to come up with optimal uh, levels of the microRNAs and you know, how much uh, uh, you need for inducing a cell cycle and how many cells come out in the end. Um, but uh, you know, so I think this probably is a start and we have to uh, you know, go a long way uh, from here. 
Okay, so Angelo is, is asking, Karimaya said migration to the site of damage is also required to initiate a regenerative response. Is there any evidence that 294 exerts a migratory phenotype in vitro and vivo? Yeah, that's a good point. So I haven't thought about it really, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, uh, um, we have not looked at, it, uh, at uh, this thing uh, at the moment, but maybe, you know, in the future we can uh, check uh, whether there's any kind of uh, migration of the cells or not. There's, there's a good idea for an experiment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next one is I have a query about the potential uh, use of this uh, microRNA as a therapeutic agent. If somehow delivered to the cardiomyocytes post MI in the patient, uh, would it only be able to activate proliferation in mononucleated cells? If yes, what is your take on its potential as a therapeutic since most of the cells would be binuclear? Um, yeah, so this is a good point. So, what is interesting, though, is uh, that the human heart is largely mononucleated. And um, the, uh, I think about 70% of the cells are um, around that mark are, are mononucleated and the rest are binucleated. So what we see in, in, in animals is not really true in humans. So in, hum uh, in mouse heart, we see mostly binucleated cells. Uh, so, um, you know, so one thing would be, uh, but again, why do those mon mononucleated cells, they don't proliferate? Uh, you know, we don't know at this point. Uh, and uh, yes, it would be an interesting strategy going forward uh, to activate uh, proliferation and see uh, whether you can really lead to a, uh, you know, significant response uh, in the cell in terms of cell cycle reentry. Okay, so uh, Manulis is asking, was uh, microRNA 294 delivered specifically to cardiomyocytes? What about other types of cardiac cells uh, did you see and affect an angenic response? Yes, so um, uh, as I said, the, uh, the construct uh, carried an alpha MHC promoter. Uh, so uh, 294 was going specifically in, in alpha MHC expressing cells. And uh, we, uh, so the other cells, uh, you know, we have not really looked as a, uh, you know, a, a co-staining approach or something of that sort. Um, so we have not looked at individual cells, uh, but we did look at angenic response and we do uh, see an increase in genic response at eight weeks uh, uh, after MI. Okay, so MI is asking the likes of uh, Tamamori at all showed that not only expression of various cell cycle components were important to increase proliferation and mature of cardiomyocytes, uh, but their localization is important. Uh, there seems to be a block prevention of nuclear localization shortly after birth of CDKs and cycling. Did you look at all uh, at all at localization? Um, no, we have not uh, looked at localization. So the 294, um, you know, so we, we did not look at where the cycling would actually localization. That's a good point. We can look at that. Uh, did you look at all uh, the effect of could be somewhat indirect through affecting protein shuttling? Good point. Uh, we have not really looked into into that. Um, you know, again, uh, and I wasn't sure if there are microRNA 294 binding sites in the G2M cell cycle genes or if the effect is indirect. Um, so uh, the 294, uh, what we found was uh, has a binding site in B1 kinase, and B1 is a G2M checkpoint uh, gene. So. Um, you know, so that's something that we uh, see is happening in, in the cells. And, um, you know, we, but we did not look at any other uh, cell type uh, and the effect of uh, other genes that may be uh, affected in the G2M. Okay, I guess uh, that was it. And, okay, let me go through the... Uh, so Moxon, you know, go as long as you want, or you can stop now. I mean, you've gone through a lot of questions. So the chat or I'm, I'm completely happy for you to continue. And I think we've got a lot of people still here, but it's completely up to you. Um, so I can take maybe one or two questions and see uh, if there are any questions there. So I guess I answered that. But you, I mean, there's still questions in the Q and A. Is that what you mean? Or did you not oh. see them? Oh, right. Okay. So uh, does microRNA 294 express a non cardiomyocyte heart cell since expression is still high in the first week uh, postnatal heart? What's the role of 294 in uh, the 
um, postnatal cardiomyocyte regeneration. So yeah, we have not looked at uh, postnatal regeneration at this point. Uh, we do know that uh, 294 is expressed uh, in the postnatal period. So it's highly expressed in the day one heart. And uh, by day seven, it goes down. So it uh, seems like there's some sort of uh, postnatal expression, but we have not really looked into uh, postnatal cardiomyocyte regeneration. Okay, so another one is, have you cultured the microRNA 294 overexpressing adult cardiomyocytes for longer than 72 hours? It would be interesting to see if the new deformed cells are electrically coupled with the existing. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, we uh, have not done that correctly, but we want to do this in the next, uh, um, uh, you know, few um, once we are back, of course, but uh, which is something of, of, of an interest to see, uh, you know, how long can you really push these uh, myocytes and um, you know, the, the feline culture system, as I said, uh, provides a, an interesting uh, system to look at long-term myocyte, um, you know, cell cycle. I, I mean, I think it also depends on whether you culture in FCS or not and what percent, what concentration or percentage. Right. Concentration, what percentage. Because, you know, we've done long-term cultures in 10% FCS and you can really keep them going for a long time. But then okay. they differentiate into God knows what else, you know. They dry, start driving these pil philopodia and uh, even start getting some automaticity. So I think there's probably a limit to where you want to drive it, particularly if you want to do right. long-term cultures, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. And that's pretty much the limitation of uh, the adult uh, myocyte uh, culture system. Uh, you know, so uh, ideally you would want to see everything in adult myocytes and but the adult myocytes will not proliferate like in 24 hours or 48 hours. Mm -hmm. They take a lot longer uh, to, um, you know, activate the cell cycle and proliferate, uh, but then they change, uh, you know, so you don't have a reliable culture system. Uh, I think the best approach would be to go in vivo and look at the adult mouse uh, heart cells in, in an isolated system or something, um, or a genetic lineage tracing approach uh, uh, where you can, you know, really look at adult myocytes uh, uh, proliferation. Um, okay, so next one is another anonymous uh, attendee. Okay, so did you uh, differentiate our exosome from microvesicles? Uh, do you think the content of the exosomes is different uh, from microvesicles? Uh, yeah, so uh, the exosomes uh, that we have uh, were largely between 30 to uh, 150 nanometer, and that's something uh, that has been reported for uh, the exosome uh, size um, and, uh, you know, the anything Thing above 200 nanometer is considered to be a microvesicle, and um, and I think the the current um, International Society of Exosome um, uh, Research and uh, their current uh, nomenclature states that they're all uh, EVs, extracellular vesicles. So and they're they're kind of getting away from the microvesicle exosome based uh, differentiation of others and calling it EVs uh, uh, mostly. So. Uh, but yes, uh, in our study, we, we did found them to be um, not greater than 150 nanometers. Okay, so uh, Angela is asking a philosophical question. Um, and uh, so, however, how do you reconcile that several distinct pathways may exert a regenerative response without any uh, apparent overlap among these pathways? Uh, can these various pathways exist in a vacuum and independently promote cardiomyocyte cell cycle and re-entry and subsequent uh, uh, cytokinases? Um, well, yeah, it's an interesting. I mean, look at it this way, you know. So, uh, if you're not talking about cardiomyocyte proliferation, you're talking about any other signaling pathway, right? Cardiac fibrosis uh, or anything. There are a bunch of different uh, signaling molecules, right, that they can um, manipulate. Uh, the final outcome, which is uh, fibrosis in the heart. So at the same time, uh, it, it's the same concept, you know, so myocyte proliferation and myocyte cell cycle reactivation could be, um, you know, targeted, uh, you know, they, they may exist in, in, uh, in synergy or they maybe uh, have uh, something completely independent. Uh, but of course, uh, it's a complicated system and, you know, all of these uh, things may need to be happening uh, you know, in tandem or in, uh, you know, in some sort of synergy to induce a, a response. And that's why you have so many different studies, right? So you have so many studies and so many different signaling pathways uh, being reported that uh, lead to cardiomyocyte proliferation. So 
Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it could be, uh, you know, like, uh, a bunch of different things that are coming together and um, having a, a positive response uh, towards uh, proliferation. By the way, I look forward to your response to the next question. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is from Peter Wilshurst, who gave an amazing webinar. On okay. Right. So Peter is asking, there are a number of commercial companies that are conducting clinical trials and involved injecting so-called stem cells into patients uh, with myocardial infarction, uh, with dilated cardiomyopathy. Somehow they get ethics approval from review boards, uh, ethics committees. Do you think that any of these studies have any merit? And if so, what? Or are they all just con tricks? Oh, okay. <laughs> Be careful what you say. <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, so, um, you know, so I just look at the data at this point and I would say, um, uh, you know, so there have been at least uh, two uh, meta-analysis studies that have been published in, in circulation research. And um, they, uh, and one of them looked at uh, cardiac stem cell uh, isolated from, uh, you know, preclinical models of, of uh, mouse, large animals and, and different state. And this was, uh, you know, those studies were about, like, I think more than 100 studies reported by all over the world, not just one lab. And um, they concluded, uh, so the meta-analysis concluded that there's a, uh, I think about 11% increase in injection fraction uh, with that stem cell therapy from all the preclinical studies uh, that were conducted, not just one lab, again, different labs all around the world. So, um, and that's the, the other meta-analysis again, uh, talks about the same, um, you know, stem cell uh, the response. And uh, I think they talk about bone marrow uh, stem cells and they do not show um, more than a 5% increase in injection fraction. But what they do show is that all these, these uh, you know, preclinical studies have been largely safe. So the stem cells do not really induce something you know, an unsafe response in, in, in whatever treatment that you are giving. So now, you know, really is, it depends how you interpret all these studies, right? So if you are testing a, a therapeutic target, would you be happy with 11% increase in injection fraction? Or would you say, no, I don't care about 11% injection fraction. And, um, you know, so that's where the field is pretty much. And, and you know, I, I'd say, um, there's a lot of data that suggests that the cells uh, are safe, and I have not really come across a study that is uh, that says that there is an adverse reaction, or or or, and you know, um, in the patients who received the cells, or they died because of uh, the the cells. Um, so I don't, you know, that that's pretty much what my take is, you know. So uh, I'd see the data and and see um, again you know, in this interpretation of what you would see about 12% increase in ejection fraction or 11%, and would you say that is significant or not? Okay, so um, um, next is uh, Dr. Wong, uh, and uh, there's a uh, mean 294 change in cardiomyocyte 4 population in MI uh, sequencing data set. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. So, they did not look at two microRNAs uh, in there. This was just a single cell sequencing for um, you know, gene analysis. So I think you have to do a microRNA array for that. Uh, but maybe an interesting thing to look at uh, some of the other characteristics of the CM4 population and then see uh, you know, whether there's any similarities with 294. Okay. Well, I think you've reached the end, believe it or not. <laughs> no, it's, 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 uh, it's quite an effort. We always get lots of questions in these webinars and uh, it's impressive that you managed to get through all of them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, it's, uh, it's an interesting, uh, again, an interesting experience, right? Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. That's what everyone says. Well, so look, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for a really ama amazing talk mm -hmm. and, and actually even more impressive response to questions. Um, I quite liked in the chat, there was a comment from uh, somebody called Olkayode Aremu. And he said, very good work, Moxin, you drove it home. And I think that's probably the true uh, thing to say at the end. Um, I think it was really exceptional. And, you know, we've still got over 100 people listening to us an hour in, which tells you that uh, you really gave a good webinar. So 
thanks once again. Thank you to everyone who was watching and for engaging and join us tomorrow again. We've got Professor uh, Zucker um, talking about oxidative stress and I'm sure that will be uh, as impressive as today's. So, Moxon, thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot, Robert. Thank you.